Ever wondered what dependency injection is and how it works? Let's find out by taking a real example. Let's imagine we have a class called job queue that is used for storing jobs in a queue-like way, meaning that other classes that we call generically clients are able to add or retrieve jobs from that queue. The jobs themselves are not relevant, they can be anything like CI/CD jobs or long-running batch jobs. Now let's say we want to send an email whenever a job is added or removed from the queue. So we decide to do that by using another class that we call email notifier, which will take care of the email sending process. Let's take a look on the code of the job queue class. As you can see, it's pretty simple and straightforward. There's a native internal queue used for the actual job storage that is managed by two public methods for adding or removal of the jobs. To keep the code simple, we omitted edge cases like when the queue gets full or when it's empty. There is also a private instance of the email notifier class used to send the email when we need to. The email notifier class is again very simple. It only uses an internal email service to send the actual email. We can just assume that it's doing the right job. Now, notice that if you want to use the job queue class, an instance of the email notifier class will be created internally as a private field. We are not able to interact with that field from the outside of the class. In software engineering, this is known as a tight coupling between those classes. Or in other words, email notifier class is a strong dependency of the job queue class. Strong dependencies are generally not desired for two main reasons. First, if we change something in a dependency, then we need to also update all the components that depend on it. In our case, if we change the email notifier class, like renaming the notify method to send email, then we need to also update the job queue class to match the change in the dependency. And also, testing becomes problematic. Let's assume you want to build a very simple test for the job queue class. We add a job with a particular ID and we want to retrieve a job with the same ID. Now, what if we want to check whether the send email method has been called with the appropriate parameters? If we're using Mojito, which is a popular testing framework for Java, we would do this by adding a verifier assert, which simply checks the number of times a specific method has been called on a Mac object. And as you might have guessed, to be able to do that, we need to mock the email notifier object in the test and pass it to the job queue class which is something we can't really do here because the object is private. So what can we do to prevent those kind of problems to show up? Well, that's the reason dependency injection was created. The core idea of dependency injection is that it decouples the object creation from its usage. And it does that by the use of a framework which acts as a layer of abstraction between those actions. The framework itself contains three main components. The dependency graph, which is basically an object that contains a graph with all dependencies in our project, containers, which are places where dependencies are created by the programmer, and wirings, which are instructions that tell the dependency injection framework how to manage dependencies. A popular dependency injection framework for JVM-based languages is Juice. It was built by Google and it's really simple to use. There's a link in the description where you can check it out. Now let's take a really simple example to just get an idea on how Juice works. You'll be surprised about how simple it is. Let's say we have this car class which has an engine as a dependency. The engine is just an empty class for simplicity. Now, when we want to create an instance of the car class, we also have to provide a new engine object, as required by its constructor. So we want to use Juice to inject that dependency instead of creating it directly. The first thing we need to do is to create a new class that looks like that. In Juice, modules are just classes where dependencies are defined. They need to extend abstract module because that's how Juice can identify them. They are also called containers in other frameworks. To declare a dependency in Juice, we need to create a method inside a module that returns the type of that dependency, as we can see here. The name of the method is not important, it can be anything. However, it is important to annotate the method with the provides annotation, which tells you that this method describes a dependency. And lastly, we just have to actually create an instance of dependency, in that case to create a new engine object. And that's all about it. 
we can see a module just like a class where all dependencies are defined. We got a module, now we need to use it, right? Well, to do that, we need to create an injector object, which is a class that holds the juice dependency graph. Of course, to be able to create that graph, we need to pass in all modules that we've created. Now, to get an instance of the class with juice, we have to use the injector for that, as you can see here. By calling get instance on the injector, we're basically requesting from juice an instance of a particular class. To complete our example, there's one last thing we need to do. In the car class, we need to annotate the constructor with the inject annotation, which tells juice that it should inject the engine object in this constructor when it tries to create an instance of the car class. And that's it! We managed to use juice to add our first dependency. Now let's apply the same changes to our initial example. We got a job queue and the email notifier classes as we know them from the beginning. The job queue module looks like that. It's nearly identical to the one in the previous example. We just create one dependency method that creates a new email notifier object. In main method, we create the injector object by passing a new instance of the job queue module and we use the get instance method to get a new job queue object. And finally, we annotate the constructor of the job queue class with the inject annotation to signal juice that it should provide a dependency from its graph. But even with those changes, the email notifier is still a strong dependency on the job queue class. Let's decouple those classes by creating an interface that we call notifier, which only has a notify method. We update the email notifier class to implement that interface, and in the module, we add our first wiring which is the bind call in Juice. This is a simple instruction that tells Juice to link an interface to an implementation, so whenever you need a dependency of type notifier, Juice will create an instance of email notifier. Notice that we added this wiring into a special method called configure, which is just a place in a module where Juice looks for wirings. We also need to update the job queue class to use a generic notifier now instead of a specific email notifier. This is a decoupling technique in line with the object-oriented principles, because the client code, in that case job queue, can only use what the interface, also known as the contract, is specifying. In that case, it can only call the notify method and nothing else. Also, if you want to switch the implementation to another one like Slack notifier or SMS notifier, you only have to update the bind wiring in the module. And that's all about it. Now we got two fully decoupled components managed by a dependency injection framework. If you want to check the code, there's a link in the description for that. Thank you for watching, and if you liked that video, don't forget to like and subscribe because more incredible content is on the way.